everybody. We are here with the second game of Peace up against the Red Cannons. And already we are dropping hot into this pick and ban. As you can see, the bans and the picks. Why don't you walk us through it, Wolf? Well, I mean, you could see that there's already a pretty big parallel between what we saw in the previous game and the second one here is we will see Titan once again on the Ezreal. Gigo's going to be on that cannon. The big difference being that the Leona was picked up early this time for Peace instead of the Nami. So they deny the pick as well as are going to pick it up themselves. And you see a lot of power that's going to be in this bot duo will be transferred towards kind of those later game engages. Yes, you can still obviously take 2v2s. We don't know the support partner that Titan is going to be playing with just yet. Taking a look at some of the bands across the board that we're looking at here. See the Camille was taken away from Gigo. See those same bands we saw last game in the Misfortune the Aurelia Nocturne and the Trindomir removed once again as Pike being considered. Love to see it, but uh, don't think it's going to make it through this draft. Not in this meta. Yeah, uh, Rakan seems likely uh, with what they already have. Tons of mobility, huge engage potential to set up the cannon. And it is going to be the toys. I mean, we already saw a lot of supports actually taken off the board as well. The Braum and the Yumi as well as the Leona takeaway from the side of Peace. So now Peace, they have to decide on what is going to be their solo lanes here. They do know that the cannon is coming in here. Do they want to run back the Rumble? Were they happy with that? And, you know, even in the first game, they did go for the blind pick Silas, and that is going to be the choice here once again for Tally. Yeah, obviously the Kled is still available. They wanted to go down that counter path once again. So a big question here, did end up working out for Grevthar at the end of the day is, hey, that's something different. Ooh. Looks like we're going to have the soul lane here with the Jarvan uh, because it is still a flex pick. It's kind of a bit of a, bit of a running joke here. It could be flexed in all four roles. But we finally get to see Bob Nilly, which was target banned against him in the beginning of the group stage. And it's something he hasn't been allowed to play outside of that previous game we just watched. Didn't pick it up then, but he will take it to the Rift here in game two. Now we're trying to see what that final pick is going to be that counter pick here for the Silas. And once again, it's going to be the Kled instantly locked in. So we've got a very similar game on our hands here. The difference being the supports, of course, and the swap there of the Jarvan into the top lane. But there's a lot of power in this Nidalee, something that was missing in the previous set. Yes, you could burn a lot of health, a lot of those health bars away with those equalizers, but Nidalee gives you that consistent poke. It's not an ultimate ability, that spear. It's going to be available nonstop to threaten and chunk down what is overall not a very tanky roster here on the side of Red Cannons. Yeah, and Peace might want to recreate what they were able to create in game number one with some of that early lead going on here. This time, not with the Jarvan, which honestly wasn't a lot of the engine of what got them going in that one. But the Nidalee can absolutely do it. You've got a couple of solo lanes that can be gankable. The Jarvan and the Silas, of course. The Kled's going to be getting in there a lot. And this Nidalee can be super active. It's Bobbit. You know, I think this is his big opportunity to step up and try to carry on one of his big picks. Again, though, on the other side, we are looking at an extremely similar draft from the side of Red Cannons. This time, though, they just have Rakan instead of Leona. So you have even more hard engage, especially in team fights, and everything else is the same. Yeah. The Rakan is going to struggle a lot in terms of being able to engage into the Leona, especially in the early part of that laning phase with an Ezreal that's still fairly fragile at that stage. But... We made the same sort of claims about Titan's early game when he was against the Lucian Nami lane, and he ended up trading a lot of those kills back, getting a lot of gold in his pocket early, and obviously the rest was history. We'll see what happens here in this second game, as Jojo has a lot of agency on this Rakan to set up flanks, and when you have to deal with both the potential for, of a Rakan flank, as well as Lee Sin, who could maybe kick somebody and get a pick, then you have to deal with Gigo's ability to slicing Maelstrom in, and Grevthar's long-range engage on the Kled is very strong. Absolutely. So, guys, hashtag varieties in 5G all chat. Just uh, go out there, get on Twitter, do the hashtag, and let us know what you're thinking about this series, about today, about anything that we have here at World. Any opinions or cheers or well wishes that you do want to throw out to any of the people involved is always welcome. Make sure to hashtag Verizon 5G all chat and we will uh, get your tweet up in the broadcast. So always uh, a fun little thing that we do have going on as we are getting into this game. 
Trying to see what else we can see here. Once again, it's no flash from the side of this Kled mid. Just looking to get ultra aggressive with that Ignite. And it worked out for him in game one. Yeah, very powerful duelist, you know, and if you end up getting in one of those scenarios where Tally falls far behind or ends up trying to take a bad trade and gets picked, it's one of the ways that this roaming Kled can become such a great threat. Um, we didn't really see it happen last game, but as I was mentioning uh, just moments ago, there's a lot of tools for Red Cans, as we saw in the last game, to fight room, you know, constantly throughout the map and then control that vision. Because that's something that we talked a lot about in the first game, but their consistent control of vision made it so difficult for Peace to actually get back into the game around those objectives. And when you have to go into choke points dealing with that cannon ultimate, it's often just a disaster, not a fight you want to take. But well, sometimes you just don't have that the option to, to not take it, right, when you're that far behind in the later stages. Curious to see how this top lane is going to go. I think it's going to be the biggest difference outside of the, the jungle pick here for Bobip, right? We saw that the Rumble uh, had a very comfortable early game against this Kennen and even got some help from the team as well. So I want to see how Visitatsi will do on the Jarvan into Kennen matchup. Looks like so far things are, are going pretty well, you know, but it's still early on in this game. And, you know, generally the melee into range is not always the best, especially against a champion like Kennen, but we'll have to see if he can get some hard engages going down there up in the top lane and really put the pressure on Tagigo. I'm curious to see what Bobak is going to build um, because we have been seeing a new trend recently of Rocket Belt being built instead of the Night Harvester on Italy these days. It's kind of a new up-and-coming solo queue thing. I haven't yet seen how the pros are going to build that here in Worlds 2021. So something to track for sure is we have an engage. I'm getting in there as Aladoric, but immediately trying to run away. But now they're trying to get on in there. The exhaust will come out, but Titan is going to flash away. Get some room to get away from this. We also got a fight in the jungle that's going on and a re-engage in the bottom lane. Aladoric's getting so low, but Violet has the upper hand on the enemy eating carry. Now going to the jungle, we finally see that he just went a little bit too far in the enemy jungle and peace we're able to collapse onto him looks like tally comes over gives bob up the assist is going to be able to help take him out take out aegis that is to say so i mean there's there's two kills here going over the side of peace to just the one on red and this time around once again titan isn't going to pick up the kill is only going to get the assist here on the ezreal so not going to pick up that first blood that's going to go over to jojo so a lot here in terms of this early game shaping up to be a similar uh, yet significantly different <laughs> as we do see once again an aggressive game. Aladoric with a roam is on seed, did sweep this brush. Our Grevthar respects the fact that he doesn't know where the enemy Leona is. Yeah, he's got Bob up here as well. Just gonna take down the Scuttle Crab. Not really without any hitches here. Aladoric can just return back down to the bottom side, so. Yes, very much the same, but also very different as he just, you can see he was getting very aggressive. He lands that Q and he goes in for this. Yeah, it goes in. You can see that on the mini-map that, yes, Grevthar is trying to contest this rotation coming up from Tally, but he's not able to do so, and Tally will be able to take the Blast Plant. And just barely saves Bob's life there, connects there with the chains. <laughs> you can see how hyped he is about that <laughs> kill. It's so important. Yeah. Huge Nice comes in. Looks like he just isn't uh, really bothered. He knows it's still early on in this game. But still, that's that's a rough kill to give over to Tally, especially with how good he looked on the Silas in uh, game number one, even though they didn't uh, end up winning that one. As Bobbit was getting a little bit aggressive, this is something he can do after getting a nice little trade over the enemy jungle. As Vigitati, not going to know that Aegis is here, as he does get stunned up, and the flash still available, but so much damage being used already. Waits for that Q, the follow-up from the Lee Sin, and he will be able to flash to safety. So he does escape with his life here, but does have to use that flash. Will, of course, have to back. Doesn't have teleport either, so this is still a pretty significant exchange here on the top side of the map. All summoners down now for the top laners, but this does give Gigo the opportunity to catch up with some of that farm. That is going to be a long walk back to the top lane. See if Tally decides to go in on this teleport, because it wouldn't be the first time we've seen that in this series. We'll just decide to yeah. back away. But I, I got to say, you know, the more things change, the more they say the same, right? We have a very slight lead here for Peace. 
And yet, you know, mid lane control going over to this Kled. Now, the question becomes, will we see more effective teleport usage out of Gigo this game? Will we be able to get more slicing mails from pressure in the mid game as Tally getting oh. collapsed on? Yeah, he's going to get roped up here as he just is looking for the Q, but this is level six Silas, who is not exactly going to be too scared of you just yet. Just went back and bought and teleported back to lane, so you could see why they were trying to put on that pressure. But Tally with the lost chapter. And a refillable, he will be just fine as now Rip Cannon's trying to get aggressive. They know that Visit Chachi does not have flash, and just a little bit of pressure on the map is all they need to get him to back off of a big wave on the top side. They're really playing this nice tug of war game as well with Tally, just forcing him to bounce between the pressure there from Grevthar in mid as well as that pressure that's coming on the top side. So just trying to make him lose waves. He's actually managed the waves really well, regardless, and is going to be able to stabilize there in the mid of the map. Grevthar once again walks over a ward here. He's such a, <laughs> an aggressive mid laner when he's on champions like this, where he has the lead yep. in the matchup, has that pushing power. And those control wards are getting so much value once again here for Peace. Yeah, definitely a good one placed down there, probably by Aladork a little bit uh, earlier on. And this bottom lane, once again, you have to say, I mean, even with the Lucian trying to get some early pressure, he got that early kill down there with a good trade as Bobbit. He is going to be spotted. Aladoric is not, but it might be enough to just say to Grevthar, okay, I have to get out of here. So the rotation is spotted. We'll see Aladoric this time as well. And Grevthar's totally fine, even without the flash. Like, as long as he doesn't go super ham all the time and he plays respectfully, he will be okay on this clip. Yeah, should be as Gigo here. Still without summoners, of course. Now, we talked about this last game, and it was a really quite a, a point of contention for the early to mid game for Red Cannons was the fact that they couldn't use the teleporting cannon to their advantage around those first few objective fights. And that might hold true in this game once again, as... Okay, it was <laughs> scary for a moment there. <laughs> Will be just fine, as they do clean that up. I like that as a Chachi is looking for these opportunities, you know, just waiting in the brush that he knows he has vision control of. But take a look at this, Grevthar now over vision. Will be spotted. You know, this has been the, uh, the story for his mid lane. Yeah. He's trying to be aggressive, but spotted every time. So in the early game, he's not really able to get as much done as he was in game number one. As here we go, Visit Chachi finds the flag and drag. Is it enough damage? The slicing Maelstrom is trying to keep him alive, but it will not be enough. No summoners for either side. Will be advantage Jarvin if he gets the jump on that cannon. They're going to look for a play here in mid, but again, that vision you talked about makes it so difficult to catch anyone here on Peace. And that's going to be a Rift Herald start here for Bobbit. Without the presence of this cannon, who obviously doesn't have his ultimate, even if he were here, feel very comfortable right now about actually forcing your way into this part of the jungle because you have so much vision control. Look how deep the warding is. This is a far cry from what we saw in the previous set in terms of controlling the top side of the map much more power here to Peace, and Red just going to look for a little bit of a skirmish. Positional advantage, though, definitely going to Peace, as Gigo finally gets back to the lane, but he's going to deal with that wave. He can't come down here. They're still going in. Okay, the charge is going to just charge him to safety away from the enemy, as, uh, of course, he cannot be disabled during that one, so no solar flare value out of that. And once again, I mean, it feels like deja vu, just like last game. This time, Titan is able to get a plate, but they decide, okay, we're going to Pressure around the Rift Herald, not fully commit. Gigo returns to lane, grabs that farm, grab a turret plate for Titan, might actually grab two here. He's getting very close yeah. to it. And this is a little bit more value for Red Cannons this time around with that give up on the Rift Herald. Yeah, like it does feel good for Titan here. The Rift Herald is going to be used in the top side and they should be able to get first turret blood. So they're kind of trading sides. And you have to ask the question, you know, do you, do you feel comfortable giving all this gold over to Bobip and Violet? And at the same time, kind of getting Titan fed. I suppose it's not really in Red Cannon's control, as it's kind of peace that are dictating the flow of this one after they do pick up the Rift Herald. But uh, still, I mean, this is a, another fed Ezreal. It's not two kills this time, but it's a lot of plates and, and value here for Teton. Still going to be good on the scoreboard for the side of peace, of course, after getting that big objective and pushing into the top side. I, ju I just want to see what Violet can do this time around on the carry. Exactly. It's going to be very different than the last time, as you mentioned, with Teton not having the same amount of kills. And we're still at a stage where the Lucian is quite online yet but he is going to be very powerful very soon. Does Just picked up his Gale Force, and that's going to be a really huge opportunity for him to have a lot more mobility, look for these fights around the objectives. Unfortunately, 
you know, this last objective that was just taken here for Red Cans was taken without a hitch because there was such a commitment to the top side of the map for peace rather than splitting. And that means that, you know, you get a lot of plates for free. You also get a Drake. So in terms of losing Rift Heralds, this is about as good as it gets. Yeah, that is definitely true. As you see them rotating now down towards the bottom side once again here. Red Cannons, if possible, trying to get some no value. Vision. And Va Violet goes right in. No Q from the Lee Sin first, and no level six for Jojo. Jojo rather is so important for making sure that Violet stays alive. But now we do have the dash forward and exhaust. This time he is going to have to flash over the wall as it is a manhunt that's coming in. But now they're getting it turned on top of them as in goes Aladoric. Going to get this one started. Gigo does not get a lot of value here on the slicing maelstrom as we do have Vizitachi super deep in that one, trying to get on top of Aegis, and he will be able to pick up that kill as now the team is following up. Tally and Violet able to help them out as Gigo trying to escape, and we are all over the map now. Even Visit Chachi's gonna go down. Grefthar picks up the shutdown gold onto the Jarvan, who was able to build up that bounty, and Red, not too fussed about that one. They seem okay. Yeah, they end up pulling, pulling it off, which was quite surprising considering the way the middle of that fight went. Gigo finally is able to teleport into a fight and get a slicing Maelstrom off, but there's not enough follow-up damage there in that initial exchange. They really wanted more out of that because they saw an opportunity. They see Violet, they could maybe gr get the jump on him. He's got Gale Force, gets away, but despite his ability to escape there, they're still able to collapse and get a pick. I thought we were going to have action there in the mid lane again for a second. As, you know, for Gigo here, once again, his ability to really turn these teleports into game-changing plays hasn't been there, but this time more successful than the last. But we do have to keep going back to the fact that this time, Titan is playing kind of on a fair, even playing field. He's actually, in fact, about 600 gold behind Violet right now. So this game is going to feel very different as a result. He isn't just going to be able to pop off in five minutes' time. We're going to have to wait and see that late game, Ezreal. It's going to be a much slower road towards that win condition. Yeah, absolutely. This is uh, Valet's turn to shine, essentially, picking up one of the first Mythics in the game on that Gale Force. As Vizit Chachi now, he's got some very deep vision in the enemy jungle, as it seems like the enemy team now is collapsing on them. There is this Blast Plant here that might get him to safety, as he knocks over the Lee Sin, and he leaves himself over the wall, as a Flag and Drag actually gets him some room here, but he will be eventually taken down as he has to avoid the charge, and he just will just emote his way to the kill. <laughs> Emotes his way to the kill. The, the trade-off is that a lot of minions will be lost in the mid lane. Extra plate going over to Violet here, and they're actually going to turn this into potentially more yeah. than just a plate. We got multiple teleports coming in. Big uh, Recon Charm onto multiple, but there's so many members of Peace here, but Grefthar trying to run him up, trying to get that damage down, but it will not be enough. There is just no support for him. It's a double kill now for Violet, and JoJo is alone, gets knocked up with the flash. And that will be a huge conversion here for the side of Peace. Yeah, this is starting to become such a lead. Coming back in this game for Red Cat is going to be a really, really tough challenge. And again, different from last game, there's so much more vision control here for the side of Peace. They're starting to get deep vision on both the bottom side, as you can see here, and a little bit there on the top side. So. This is not going to be a game where Red Cannons can actually just run around the map, start taking away those jungle camps, and then you know put the pressure on macro-wise because you've lost a lot of structures already. Two turrets are down. You, you've given this Lucian a huge lead, and in the mid game he's going to excel with it as once again looking for a fight. Now we're going to see the stun does come in. Tally a little bit all alone. His team does round the bend, but so much damage being taken right now from the Silas. The slicing Maelstrom doesn't get much down now. Taladoric's turn to go in. We are just trading blows. It's like we're watching a boxing match right now. Yeah, a lot of extra pushing power going to Titan on the bottom side. He is free farming right now, so he's the really big winner of this exchange here in the middle of the map. The amount of power that you could have gotten from Peace there was quite high if they were able to get those picks. Unsuccessful nonetheless. You can see Red finally clearing up some of that lost vision here around the top side of the map. Finally starting to get a little bit more of a chokehold on their side of the jungle. But these lanes have now kind of gone a little bit uh, blue-sided, I guess you could say, peace-sided here. Is farming this out for the Ezreal on a map where you don't have vision control is one of the scariest things you could do. Because, yes, you have a lot of mobility as Ezreal, but he doesn't have a mythic. He's not going to be able to do it. Oh, everything missing here. He 
Beast doing a good job of controlling the vision around this objective, but it's going to be this Lola Flare now down. Tally has good position on this bottom lane, but we'll see how Red can play around the Solar Flare being down. The Rift Herald was trying to be taken here by Visit Chachi for quite a while. And one thing I want to turn your attention to is that Vigo is up two levels on him so far, even though the CS is not that big of a difference, and, and Jarvan even has two kills. So Vigo's been doing a, a much better job of just soaking experience around the map. And that's something that Visit Chachi will have to be careful about. He picks up level 10 as he reaches the top lane. Yeah, as soon as that 13 is reached as well, it's going to give Vigo a lot more power in these upcoming team fights. A bit concerned about him going down to the lane right there with obviously Tally nearby. We will see, by the way, that uh, Rocket Belt picked up for Babam that we were talking about earlier. He is going down that path. Ooh. It's just waiting for any Three. chance that he can get. Very Maybe scary. now has a chance he can go for this objective. Yeah, they are going to look for this objective now. And part of the power of this Nidalee is going to be her ability to hit a spear onto someone like Titan or Gigo. Then use that Rocket Belt to close the distance and actually look for the follow one kill. If you can execute someone or put them so low that they're irrelevant in the fight with this Nidalee, that's where the power is going to lie, and that becomes a lot more deadly later on. He's picked up five assists this game. Doesn't have a huge amount of far. Or hold that thought. Once again, <laughs> we're going in. Okay, that's going to be the charts blocked here from Aladoric. Very nicely done. He hops off the Scarl, but this is just way too many members of Peace that are around. Tally was going to Kingslay his way to the kill. And that was multiple members that did have to go up there, but it's still a solid kill to the side of Peace with no objectives on the map at this moment in time. This is really frustrating for Red Cannons, but it's not without warning, right? I mean, you know the enemy is around that part of the jungle. You know they're doing Rift Herald. You can't push up that far in the lane. There are consequences. You will get pushed down. And yes, Kled is one of the most survivable uh, champions on the side lane like that, but there's just too many players on the peace side. They're going to collapse in and be going to oh, collapse there in. There we go. The exhaust, though, is immediately going to come down, but the CC might be enough to keep Aladoric around. The charm doesn't quite hit a lot of members here as they're even struggling to take down the support. They finally get that done. Meanwhile, though, the top lane getting a lot of value there. Uh, Shirley was getting into the inhibitor even. And so Aladoric will take that every day of the week. Uh, he's definitely going to be happy with that. Not able to quite kill the inhibitor, but sub 20 minutes. Uh, everybody knows, you know, there's been that YouTube video going around talking about this. Uh, one of our LCS casters posted online about whether you should kill inhibitors pre-20 minutes or not. Getting one this early might actually end up being more of a detriment, but if we go back to this new Axe Effect replay here, we'll to watch how this fight breaks down. The teleport comes through from Ego. He's able to get right over the wall there because he has his flash available. Likes to use both summoners every time he goes in like this. But the trap is here. This is one of the deadliest places you can run into a cannon. It's a really nice deep ward there. He's able to teleport on to get that pick. The trade-off, of course, being that damage there on the top side of the map. But you're definitely happy as Red Cannons to get a little bit more gold on the board here for Gigo. Been really liking Peace's vision control, and they're going to find another opportunity. JoJo just disappears off of the map. Seemingly had no idea they were there. There's no Dragon up at this moment in time, so you might not expect that they're pushing in this hard for the vision, but they will get the knockup as well onto Aegis. And they will have to flash to safety, and Peace are just chopping down. Bit by bit here, they get a kill, they get a flash here and there. Now they're going to get a mid turret. They're keeping the ball rolling in a big way for the side of peace. And last game, we had Teton explode into relevance so early. Even by this point of the game, it was so ahead. As we do have from Ant Phillips, today can only be described as absolutely mad. First best of five, why not have a reverse sweep? Do I see another one in the making? Let's go, peace. Hey. It's not even a 2-0 just yet. Peace might be able to turn this into a 3-1, but I'd love to see a five-game series, and we might be heading there. But as I was saying moments ago, Titan is, is not in a place this game where he can carry early. He does have that late-game scaling that he can fall back on, but this is becoming so peace dominant. This is becoming so difficult even for Titan to farm freely in the side lanes of farm in mid that, yes, you trade a tower on the, on the top side of the map with Dreftar. Yes, you're trying to get value elsewhere while Peace has this vision control, but you're not really trading up until we get way later in the game because Titan is not going to be able to fight these next objectives. This Mountain Drake that's coming up in one minute's time, you're not really quite online right now as Red Cannons, especially because you don't have that teleport for Giggle. You don't have that teleport flank. So fighting for vision as they are on the top side of the map is definitely a good way to approach it. They're grouping up. 
and trying to remove a lot of vision, at least on this section of the map, trying to make this their stronghold as this Baron comes online. Yeah, I mean, Red Cannons get, once again, so many deep wards in that Baron side of the map, but we do have Mountain Drake coming up here in 30 seconds. They're not going to have a lot of vision around there, so... I think they got to give that one up. I just don't think they're ready to fight this one just yet. Yeah, they have Divine Sunder and the Muramana, but this is not a three-item Titan. This is a level 11 Titan, right? And we see an overextension, maybe you've got an opportunity. Aladoric. He's just continuing on forward. The calling is going to blast Titan in the face here as the sun comes down. And the charm is good, but here comes Vizitachi. Knocks two of them down with the Cataclysm. And now the cavalry has arrived. The stolen charge comes in, and a gigantic Everfrost catches two of them on the backside, slows them up enough to take them both down, and only Greftar will live to tell the tale. I mean, so many great dodges there from Aladoric. He was juking and driving there against the Ezreal's Mystic Shots coming through. And Titana and crew are like, okay, well, I think we can maybe take this fight. You know, we've got a Leona out in the open. They look for the fight, but this is not, again, a time where you could realistically fight against the scrappy comp that is Peace. They're so strong in the mid game. This is a team comp that has a Silas Illusion, right? At this point in time, a Jarvan, who's very far ahead, who can easily collapse in and take that scrappy fight. If you don't have the ability to slicing Maelstrom and get high value, you're going to really struggle here. So I appreciate the idea. Okay, yes, he misses the Zenith Blade. You're kind of grouped up here. But look at where Kennen is right now. It's not a fight you want to really realistically taken, they still commit. And look at the plays here from JoJo. It's all desperation, all trying to shut this fight down, trying to go, okay, I'm, I'm gonna die so that you will live. And it's just not enough here. And this is, again, right before the Drake. And I think trying to find more objectives elsewhere, continue to focus on the top side of the map, maybe grab that inner turret, would have been the better option here for Red Cannons. <laughs> and that's, that's the reaction. That's all we get, just a huge smile on Vizitachi's face. He's able to set up yet another one. It was more like an alley-oop for him, so it's obviously always a good feel as he just slam dunks them down. And yeah, I mean, this is this is looking really good for the side of peace. How many times have we seen teams just go all in on a Leona and fail in the mid lane as well? Like this has already happened multiple times at this tournament alone. This I've been is a talking very common thing. You never want to go on that one, but they seemingly always do. As this Chachi, he's so confident, but a lot of damage is coming out from Vigo. It's gonna be close, but the flash comes in. Visit Chachi with the passive will smack down the little cannon. Yeah, not a fight you want to take as a cannon here. Once again, expecting there to be a rotation faster, perhaps from Grevthar, but he's so far away. And these small mistakes, these small overextensions and miscalculations for red cannons have really started to come back and bite them here. As this time, Red Cats do not have any vision whatsoever. Not just a lack of vision control, but no vision from Baron Pit. This is going to be so difficult to contest. And JoJo, he's trying his best. He's going to get the Solar Flare out at least. He just, though, he's he's fighting to even get a, a view of this one. As now we get the engage, and immediately they all just get blown up. Is it Chachi still in the pit? Still going to keep the Baron leashed? And this one should be a clean Baron to the side of PC. Titan is thinking about it. They still have some vision here. Let's see if, nope, not even going to be close. Titan can't do anything, has some vision, but Peace is going to take down the Baron at 24 minutes. They are dominating this game, too. Mizutachi having a great series here. Again, has been often the one focused, has been the one who's left out to dry for Peace when things go wrong in the group stage. Had a rough time, but he's really coming into his own here. First on the Rumble, now on this Jarvan. And it's a big return to form for the player who took such a long hiatus, came in here as an emergency sub here for Peace, which is one of the cool stories of them in this best of five. And we're starting to see some of Red Cannons crumbling around the late game, crumbling around decision making, because part of the reason why they couldn't contest that Baron is because a Kled with no teleport was trying to push a side lane after that pick. And mistakes like that are going to cost you big. Well, they're going to try to get this one in as Violet is in a little bit of trouble, but he is going to dash away to safety. Greptar doesn't quite have the damage, and they are forcing it so deep. As Vizitachi is like, no, I'll just go the other way. Violet in a little bit of trouble, though. That's a big kick on the hand, but still, the damage is not hitting this Lucian. It's still the low health bar, so it's the Q from downtown. He's just going to lock down that Lucian, but here's Tally going to try to go 1v4. Picked up that cannon ultimate, and it is doing so much damage here. Grepthar left to die by his teammates. They could not help him. As with the Baron and the double kill on Tally, they will look to push for more. 
just a desperate fight that Red Cannons decided to take. They thought, hey, if we could win this fight, maybe we could turn the momentum back. Thought they had an angle there. They absolutely did not. And it's the turn from Tally with that second slicing Maelstrom that really is the icing on top of the cake. Because when you are already winning a fight, then you can lock down the members who are trying to retreat. You're going to be guaranteed a lot of value here. For the damage in the team fight as Titan is starting to come online. But that damage needs to be effective. It needs to be able to lead to kills. Eliminations are what you need. If you just hit the front line a lot and then back off, yes, your num damage numbers are going to be good. But you need to get that effective damage and kill those damage dealers on the backside. If you front to back and get those kills first, if you can take out Vizitachi, then that number looks a lot better. It's not to be the case, not yet. Yeah, definitely not yet. He does have a couple of items. We'll see what he can do as this game is coming along. Teton's case is now Tally. It's getting locked down here, and this is a lot of what this game has been. Just finding opportunities somewhere on the map. The Sorelius and the Charm does come in. There's the kick. Tally in a lot of pressure, but he gets a kill to start it off. Nobody seems to have the damage to get him. He already has Zonia's as well as the Cavalry once again coming on in the 2v4 in big effect as Tally picks up another one and becomes godlike in this game. Bobby is on the angle. And he's going to be... Take it over, Wolf. You got this. <laughs> it's the spear gets the kill on Aegis. <laughs> Uh-oh, but he might go down for it as well. Has to use that Zonia's. All right, let's see if they can catch up. That is going to be Titan in a lot of trouble. Has to flash the wall as he will not get away from the legendary tally as the ace comes through. And they might just push for the win right now. Vizitachi's trying to win the game by himself here on the top side. That inhibitor that stayed up for an extra eight minutes finally does go down. And they are breaking into the base from two fronts. And this is already starting to be a great best of five. Now, just like this, Peace are right back in the game. They will take down the turrets, and they will take down the Nexus. We'll see if he just has anything to say about that. It doesn't look like it'll be much. Just a bit of fun there at the end. Peace will be taking down game number two and tying up the series. This Ezreal pick has been so pivotal for so many teams, but you could see the difference here between when you get an early lead, control the mid-game play around putting an Ezreal on the blue side of the map. You're red Ezreal and you're on the blue side of the map threatening the jungle, threatening kills. It wasn't that game this time around. He was farming fine. He was getting those turret plates on the bottom side. But the objectives that we saw from Peace were much more impactful. They controlled the map better, controlled vision around Baron. And there were some big macro mistakes, again, from Gigo on the cannon. Teleport never available when it needed to be, never able to get in there in those fights and make that big impact. We saw several times Grevthar as well trying to side lane. Wasn't there for the Baron fight. So some big macro mistakes here. And this is the storyline we had for Red Cannons is if they don't get an early lead in the laning phase, can they come back and control the late game? Was not true in game two. Absolutely. So, guys, that was the end of game two. We're all tied up once again. We're going to go to a quick break and bring back the State Farm Analyst Desk. Don't go anywhere. We'll be right back.
Welcome back to the State Farm Analyst Desk where peace strike back to bring our series score to one and one in our featured matchup presented by Mercedes Benz and Dagda. I want to jump into Champion Select almost immediately because there was one very crucial adjustment here on the side of Peace. A lot of familiar picks from game one to game two. In fact, Jarvin, one of those few picks. But it was, at the end of the day, a sweet flex to secure a signature pick for our jungler in Nidalee. Yeah, not only do you get the good matchup for Visit Chachi, but you get the Nidalee for Bapip. And for anyone who doesn't know, he's currently 6-0 and oh back in the LCO. A 68 KDA in the home region, which is absolutely insane. And we were counting backstage going, how much is he going to add to it? Eventually he does end up dying once, but right. you can see the difference, right? Early game jungle control, able to set up brilliantly, and using the fact that you've got CC across every single one of your lanes, Bapip was an absolute monster on this pick. Yeah, I mean, this is about, as you said, this is Babip. This is what he's known for. When he went to uh, TSM Academy and then went right back, he is a carry player to his bone, and he's known for his Nidalee play. And on top of that, I thought the composition was just smart. Uh, adding the Leona to the mix, and then, of course, making it so Leona Aladoric, fantastic game, able to set up for Babip consistently when they went for invades. I, I felt like they had those early... Uh, snowballs that happened from bot lane and of course in the top lane matchup like you mentioned and they were able to play accordingly through Babib so it was a great game overall it, I think this was a big difference maker from the previous game where you know Titan ran wild and it was a hectic game to now a far more controlled game on the side from Peace. Yeah, coming right back to you on this one, Raz. Uh, but akin to game one, there was a lot of early action in the bot lane, but I do think there was one crucial difference uh, that this time it was not Titan getting a bunch of kills in, t in terms of a trade between himself and the Lucian pick. And so being able to create that lead for Violet that we see here on your screens while keeping Titan down was a massive factor in the victory. 100%. And another thing that comes into play here is the support matchup. The Rakan wasn't able to do much at all versus the Leona. I thought that's what Aladoric was able to bring. And the communication to say, yeah, I have TP, we have stacking wave, let's make the play happen. Uh, that's going to be the weakness of an Ezreal play. The fact that Ezreal was able to find trade kills in the first game was more of a mistake of just the players rather than the draft itself. So... Now there has to be an adaptation from the side of Red Cannons. Yeah, and I think Peace actually made that really good adaptation in this game. We saw that they were moving Violet up towards top side. He's the one that was the recipient of all that turret gold from the Rift Herald. And then as well, playing towards him to shut down this early pressure. And I think it highlighted, one, great adaptation coming through from Peace. But two, Red still falling back into the same bad habits that we talked about in the uh, group stage of play-ins. Where, hey, Guigo's on this champion where, yes, the cannon is fine. But they're trying to make a ton of plays up towards him. And it meant that the bot lane was falling apart. And when you're looking... Looking at your Ezreal, Cheetan being your big carry for this game, leaving him high and dry is never going to end well. Right, it shows you uh, to, to a degree how important it was that those kills came over in game one. Otherwise, we could be looking at a 2-0 uh, series score because in a lot of ways, Raz, this feels like the intention of the game one draft played out here in game two. Yes, with a couple changes. And so Red Cannons can fall back on the fact that this is a tied up series. But I definitely think they need to start asking themselves some questions about how they're going to respond to a similar style draft perhaps in game three 100 percent. i think you have to add power to uh the bot lane a little bit more i think if you want to play ezreal that's completely fine you know he'll do great in the mid game but then make it so you have counter pick for support a little bit more and he's, and that you get actual value out of it uh another thing to even mention is the fact that visit chachi being on the j4 versus kennan matchup he went wild uh, being able to get the solo kill early on in the top lane that secured them Rift Herald and top lane plays that gave them that huge advantage. And then he did it again bot lane. Uh, it is a great matchup for the Jarvan. And I felt like Ego probably didn't know the matchup all too well because even though he couldn't escape the first one, he didn't know, he thought he based. The second time he fully took the fight and lost anyways. So uh, going into the next game, it's hard to get both counter pick for both support and top lane. I think it's just <laughs> up to Ego to play better and for support to just be able to get uh, that added power in the draft. And we're asking for a lot, but for good reason. Uh, that's now two games back-to-back -back where Visit Chachi has owned his lane, of course, again, with differing results. But just reliving a few of those mid-game moments here. Babip coming in with big spears and Visit Chachi over the top. Always a no-fear player.
Yeah, and we saw this again where you're looking at this big engage coming through onto the Leona, but I can see Raz, he's looking at me on the screen. He what do you want, Raz? One. Get in here! <laughs> um, it's just so funny seeing the dynamic on this team. Ever you see the faces of Babip if he gets a solo kill, same with Tally. They're screaming their heads off. With with Dad Vizzy up in the top lane, he's like, I got a good play. It's a crack of the smile. And that one, I saw a glaring smile on the camera. So it's it, Vizzy Trash is trying to be the sturdy, like, figure in the team. That one, he broke a smile. He knew he got a big play there. He may be the newest member to the roster, but he's one of the veterans on that team when it comes to International League of Legends. But we turn our attention to that game number three. For both of these teams, it's an opportunity to keep, uh, to uh, create separation, rather, uh, Dagda. And so, Red hopping to blue side for the very first time in the series. That's where my questions lie. We've talked a little bit about how the bot lane has been so pivotal to both of these teams' success. But now that we are flipping sides, where do we expect to see shakeups? if at all. I think the big one is going to be in the AD carry role. I think that's why we're seeing this transition is they're going to go, okay, can we get our hands on something like the Misfortune? Can we get our hands on the Lucian? Can we at least get some sort of pressure on this bottom side that would enable us to play around it? Because that seems to be the big issue for them right now. I think that's an interesting point, Rez, because we've talked about the Ezreal, and yes, it's a phenomenal late game carry. Again, 41% of his team's damage in that game number one to drive them to victory, but it does rely on getting to a certain state. So do you think that's the answer? Index into something more early and actually just control and run over the game from the beginning a thousand percent i mean even though i like the fact that he played it in game one like you said if you're on blue side pick up misfortune the strongest pick right now in the meta uh if they get their hands on it that's great if you can get on lucian even better uh so i think that's the big change they can make i think banning silas because if you're on blue side you have a little bit more freedom now to ban uh just specific picks that has been making it more difficult so you don't get locked into this cled matchup that has made jarvin all the more mean like all the more impactful, not only working in lane, but also it's hard to get out of Cataclysm without the flash. So I think that's probably another uh, way they can play this next game out. Misfortune plus play around it. That's what I want to see. That's what's been missing from Red County. Too much plays around topside. Don't just draft it. Just to draft yeah. it, you got to play around it. All right, well, that's what we would do if we were up there on the stage, but it's up for the teams to decide. Don't go anywhere, because after the break, we jump right in to game number three. We'll see you there.